welcome to worship this morning at uh, Speedway United Methodist Church. Glad you're all here today, whether you're in person or watching online. Um, glad that you've taken time out of your Sunday to uh, spend some time worshiping with us. Um, wanted to let you know that we are uh, uh, we have a, a discussion group that happens on Thursday evenings on uh, Zoom. If you'd like to be a part of that, what we do on Thursday evenings is we we talk about the the sermon and the message from the previous week. So it's a good place if you have any questions or comments or um, whatever wonderings, musings, whatever about the the message from the like from this Sunday on on, on Thursday. Uh, we'll be doing that. So if you'd like to be a part of that, um, call the church, email the church, let us know, and we'll make sure and, and add you to the list um, to be included, included in the Zoom discussion group. Um, as you know, you, you've, you've, you've probably figured out for a while now that there's not a whole lot going on in the church right now, right? Because of COVID and other things. We're getting better, right? We're, we're, we're starting to, to gather again. We're we're looking at doing other things in ministries. One of the things that we've been doing, though, just to, to let everybody know, so we're all kind of aware of what's going on. I've, I know I've, I've mentioned a few times in passing, there's been uh, some newsletter articles about it, but I wanted to take just a couple minutes this morning to tell you what the leadership team uh, has been working on since January and will continue to work on through the beginning of the year, or through the, uh, the end of this year. And uh, what that is, is we're looking at realigning the church. You've probably seen around the, the church different areas where, uh, where you, or newsletter where you've seen the uh, uh, now, Speedway Now. Maybe you wonder, what is Speedway Now? Well, now stands for Nurture, Outreach, and Witness. And those are the three aspects of the church that we're going to be focusing on as we move forward uh, uh, through COVID and beyond. Because we, we know that things are not going to be 100% uh, normal whatever that was beforehand, which is okay, right? Because whatever was normal beforehand wasn't working too great anyway, was it? Uh, as far as church growth and church attendance and all that kind of stuff. So maybe it's a good opportunity for us to, to kind of reevaluate and restructure. So that, that's what we're doing as the leadership team. And so we're gonna look at these three areas, nurture, outreach, and witness. And uh, just uh, for some clarification, uh, just to, to help you know what's going on, what we mean by this, nurture means we're caring for our church family. Outreach means we are caring for our community and others. Uh, and uh, witness means we are expanding our church family. So those are the three areas that we're focusing on. And um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and it's kind of hard to read, but uh, the idea there is that as we're moving forward, nurture takes in some of the areas that were previously known as and, and, and are all incorporated under nurture. Uh, education, worship, spiritual formation, membership care. Um, I can't even see it. Small groups and stewardship. Outreach um, focuses on local missions, statewide missions, national missions, and worldwide missions. And witness is public relations, advertising, marketing, inviting people, and incorporating people into our community of faith here at Speedway. So those are the three areas that we're, we're, we're looking at, and those are the different things that each of those areas encompass. Um, and then the next uh, screen is how we do this, how we staff this um, now structure. And we staff this with SPRC, Staff Parish Relations Committee, which uh, is dealing with uh, writing job description, descriptions, uh, searching for personnel, uh, developing personnel, support pastor, and uh, paid staff so the ministry can be done effectively. Uh, we staff it with trustees, care and maintenance of the church, property, so ministry can be done effectively. And we staff this through our finances, develop and strengthen the stewardship of the congregation so that ministry can be done effectively. So these are all the areas that we're working together as the leadership team and providing a sense of teamwork together and a teamwork for you to be a part of, the team with us. Uh, we can't do it on our own. I can't do it on my own. We have to work together. It takes teamwork for all of us to work together. And so what I'd like you to consider, uh, next slide please, is where do you fit in that framework? What sounds good to you? What sounds like, oh, I, I like that. I like that idea of, of reaching out to our members more. I like the idea of getting more people into church. I like the idea of uh, our church having more finances 
so we can do more things and we can invite more people and be more productive. I, li I like the idea of working with, with different missions in our community. And whatever it is that you might feel kind of called or led uh, to, to serve, I um, ask that you would prayerfully consider where, where do you fit in in this model? And we'll be talking about this for the next few weeks as we uh, help you to, to process this. And we'll have an opportunity um, probably on the day of Pentec on, on Pentecost Sunday uh, to, to have an opportunity to, to plug in and to, to, to let us know, make your, make your, uh, your desires know how you want to be a part of, of moving forward uh, as Speedway United Methodist Church. So um, any questions, comments, uh, email me. Uh, or better yet, email Sherry. She knows more than I do um, about stuff. Uh, she'll be able to help you out. I'll be able to help you out. Just, to, you know, whatever, just make sure everybody knows, you know, that we're up, we're above board, that we're not trying to do something sneaky or tricky, um, but we're um, trying to be authentic and, and open about what, what's going on in the church. So, uh, again, welcome any questions or comments that you might have. All right. So pray about that. Pray about that, uh, um, where you might fit in. All right, now that we've gone through all that, let's begin our time of worship, our time of actually uh, focusing ourselves for why we're here, and that is to experience the presence of God so that our lives might be changed, so that we might become more and more like Jesus and, and less and less like ourselves. So I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes, maybe uh, put your hands on your knees, palms up, in order to receive uh, from the Lord. Uh, this day, oftentimes when we think of a posture with prayer or, or being in the presence of God, we think of our hands folded uh, in front of us, but maybe just uh, uh, have them open so you're inviting the Spirit to come in. And take a few deep, deep breaths on your own. And as you're breathing, hear these words. Lord Jesus Christ, on the second Sunday of Easter, this day, the light of your love shines on. Your light has come into the world, and neither darkness nor evil nor death itself could overcome it. And we, like Mary, like the disciples, like Doubting Thomas, who have been there with you through Holy Week and the first Easter morning, have been made witnesses to the resurrection story wondering, bewildered, hoping, rejoicing, and yes, even sometimes doubting. It is not always to believe with our minds and trust with our hearts. So loving Christ, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold the work of your redemption. Open our minds and hearts to receive you, Lord, your resurrection glory your light everlasting. May this time of worship, reflection, and celebration be a worthy response to your love and your sacrifice for us. Together, as we pray the prayer that you taught us, your disciples, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able to as we sing uh, some songs to our, our, our King and to the risen Christ.
Amen. Just to clarify, when I say you can stand up or I tell you to sit down, you don't have to listen to me. You can sit down when everybody else is standing up. You can stand up and everybody else is sitting down. Uh, just however the Spirit leads you. It's just kind of an encouragement to pay attention to what the Spirit's telling you and to get used to moving in that Spirit. This morning, we're going to continue the Easter story that we started last week. Remember last week, if you were here, we, we talked about Mark primarily, but brought in the Gospel of John a little bit too. But today we're going to continue with John's uh, scripture reading through John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Um, and as a continuation, it's a, a story that happens in the evening of that day, that, that Easter Sunday morning. And um, we're going to read this, and the uh, words are going to be on the screen, I believe, but we're, I'm going to uh, do some ad lib as we read the scripture, just so to make sure we, we know what the scripture's uh, saying and, and, and we're, we're, we can really grasp uh, the importance of the scripture. So we're going to start with verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, they were afraid of the Jews because uh, the Jews were the ones who had uh, Jesus arrested and tried and eventually uh, killed. Now, this isn't, this isn't all Jews. This isn't an a, a, a anti-Semitic kind of reference. This doesn't give us permission to, uh, to go out and uh, uh, not love our Jewish neighbors and brothers and sisters. But it's, uh, at the time, the, the Jewish hierarchy, if you will, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious elite, the, the way the whole corrupt system worked is what is being referred to as the Jews. Not the everyday common average person necessarily, but the, the system uh, uh, that, that the Jews uh, supported. So they're afraid for, of the Jews because they knew what the Jews did to Jesus just a few days ago. I mean, for us, Good Friday was... Whew, seems like forever ago, wasn't it? Um, and Easter, just being last week, just, I mean, a lot has happened this week. But this particular incident in Scripture takes place that evening. So try to think about how you would be feeling if you were one of Jesus' closest followers and you watched him get brutally beaten and killed by this establishment by this group of people. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be pretty scared too. I wouldn't want to be identified with Jesus at this point. I might be locked in a room too. And I might like to think that I'd be bold and, you know, strut my stuff and say, no, I'm, reality is, truth is, I'd probably be cowering behind locked doors too. I think most of us would. And Jesus walks in, and he sees his disciples, his friends there, and he knows that they are in fear. And he walks in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now, they saw his, his hands in his side, the, where his, his, nail, his hands had been nailed to the cross and where a spear had been thrust in his side at the time of his death, right, before, right after the, the moment of his death. And they knew from those wounds that it was Jesus. Now, I wonder what about the rest of the scars that he had. What about the rest of the ripped flesh? And, and, and why, why was everything else apparently healed, but, but those hands and that side was, was still left uh, in the state they were in at the time of his, his burial? But everything else apparently must have been taken care of and healed so that those were, were evidence 
the hands and the side were, were evidence to the disciples that it was him. And they saw it as that. And they got excited. They rejoiced in the fact that Jesus, you know, we thought you were dead. We watched it. And here you are with us. Now, I probably be kind of dumbfounded. How about you? I know I watched you die. I know they put you in a tomb. What are you doing here? Probably caused a little bit of confusion, a little bit of consternation. And Jesus again says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that in more detail on Pentecost Sunday in a few weeks. But this idea that Jesus is, is sending his disciples and going to empower them, allow them give them the strength and the courage and the boldness to go forward and do that. But then he says this, this really odd little statement. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot on that, but I want us to think about that in terms of what it means with what else Jesus is saying. What is Jesus saying? Peace be to you. Have peace. You want to have peace in your life? Forgive the sins of others, and they'll be forgiven. Retrain, retain, retain them, and they won't be. Now, have you ever been angry at somebody because they did wrong to you? No. Surely not, right? But the longer we retain that sin, the less peace we have in our lives, right? That sin remains as long as we keep it in our minds and we keep festering in it. That sin, that sin remains. But if, if we release that sin, if we release sin from those who have hurt us, we're not contained and overcome by lack of peace in our lives because the sin has been removed. I mean, or if, yeah. So if we, re, if, if we forgive the sins, they're forgiven we can have peace. But if we retain them, we, we hold on to them, and, and peace is elusive that way. Jesus is giving them instruction to move forward. But Thomas, who was one of the, one of the disciples called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. He must have been really scared. He didn't want to have anything to do with them. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and in his side, I will not believe. He wanted the same evidence that they had. You had proof. I want proof too. I want to know that what you're telling me is true, that, that this is real, that this isn't just something that you've made up, some fantasy. I want to know what you know, and I want the same proof. Well, a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. My question is, why were they still in the house? Jesus told them to go. <laughs> Remember that first time? He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So he comes back, and there they are, still huddled in fear, behind doors, still being, staying put. But he doesn't, doesn't condemn them for that. He doesn't chide them for that. He instead... He says to Thomas, the one who wasn't there, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, 
My Lord, my God. It is you. It is, I, I recognize it now. I see you. I have that same, that same experience now that the others had that I didn't have before. And now I have it. My Lord, my God, this is great. And Jesus says to him, well, have you believed because you have seen me? How blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. That's you and me. Right? Jesus is talking to everybody in the future. Not, not just the people that were around his, his time, but everybody throughout history moving forward. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. It's hard sometimes to believe, isn't it? When we don't see that physical, tangible proof. And then John concludes the gospel by saying, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. You may have life here and now. You may have life in, in such a way that you've never known before because you have come to believe in Jesus. Let us pray. God, our creator, we come today thanking you for your unconditional love. It was with your love that you painted the sky. It was with your love that you produced the sun to keep us company as we travel during the day and the moon to accompany us as we slumber at night. Your love continues to let us know that we are never alone, but you are always with us. And so God, tattoo your words on our heart so that our souls may forever be revived. Let your precepts run through our veins, causing us to rejoice and be glad. We know the troubles that we see, but we shall rejoice and be glad. We know the hurt and the pain that we must endure, but we shall rejoice and be glad. We know that the justice system was not designed for people of our hue, but we shall rejoice and be glad. We shall rejoice because the same God who painted upon the velvety night sky is the same God who is still painting our way out. Oh Lord, we're depending on you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
This morning we're going to talk a little bit about Thomas. I always feel kind of bad for Thomas. That expression, you're, you're just as good as your last mistake. That's Thomas, isn't it? Doubting Thomas. I want to hope, hope to give him a little image boost today. A little image lift. A little face lift, if you will. Because Doubting Thomas has become this, this nickname that really kind of puts him in a bad light, doesn't it? Now, I don't think I'd like to have a nickname that started with Doubting something, Doubting Alex or whatever. I mean, actually, I've had worse than Doubting. I, when I was young, as most children who were, when they're growing up, don't like to brush your teeth very much. Did you ever go through a stage like that when you were a little kid? No, of course not, right? Well, I did. And uh, first time I met my sister's boyfriend at the time, my sister's quite a bit older than I am, um, he took a look at me. I smiled big, that's a little, little guy. And he said, man, you got the rottenest teeth I think I've ever seen. You got a mouthful of little rottos in there, don't you? Guess what my nickname was? Rotto. And that developed into Brusha. Remember the Ipana commercial? Brusha, Brusha, Brusha. Brusha. Colgate. Kogo. Um, he actually put a musical twist on it at one point. He started calling me Rotto Legato. Uh, so I've had some nicknames that I didn't care, and, and uh, I, I don't share them with you so that you can share them back with me. Uh, this was unique to this one particular individual and maybe a, a couple family members as well. And uh, that's been long forgotten. Not by me, obviously, but by others, I'm sure. So. Usually we, we pick up some kind of negative trait on somebody to give them a nickname, right? Like uh, uh, Debbie Downer, right? You know who Debbie Downer is, right? Someone's always negative about something. They're just Debbie Downer, just bleh. So um, it's usually based on something, uh, uh, some sort of a, a negative type trait or, or something humorous or, or something, uh, something humorous that somebody might have said or done. Uh, I had a friend who's... Uh, uh, nickname was Trip because he tripped all the time. Uh, so these and these nickname, nicknames they, they stick, don't they? Uh, you might be thinking of some friends that you call some had some nicknames for, and maybe you're recalling some of those now as as you're sitting here. And hopefully you are, and, and you're having some good good memories about uh, some some of your longtime lifetime friends. But what about you? What are some nicknames you've had over the years? You think about that. You know, what, we, what have you? How, how do you think people remember you from years ago, with your nicknames? And is that how you want to be remembered forever? By everyone? I mean, poor doubting Thomas, right? This is two thousand plus years ago. Two thousand years ago, and we're still calling him doubting Thomas because of this one incident, this one thing that was based on his last mistake, or perceived mistake. Was it a perceived mistake, a real mistake? Let's kind of look at that a little bit. No, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because the person who is giving you that nickname, that's their perception, whether it's real or not. So you get this nickname that sticks with you, as it has done with Thomas all these years. In, in fact, with, with Thomas, though, doubting Thomas is neither inherently good or bad, right? Dou doubting is, 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 not, is not a bad thing. In fact, we're, we're, we're hardwired to doubt, aren't we? We hear something new or something unfamiliar, and we, we doubt it until we Google it. And then we know, right? Because the Internet said so. But doubt can keep us safe, right? A, a 
recovering alcoholic who, who doubts that he can have or she can have just that one beer. Don't drink that beer. They doubt they can have that and, and remain their sobriety. So it's safer to not even try, right? Doubt can keep us safe. Doubt can also put us in a, 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 a state of, of, of fear and a state of, of, of frozenness. Where we're afraid to do anything. But that might not be a bad thing either. So I doubt I could do a cartwheel down the center aisle here. And I ain't going to try. So you're not going to see it. That'd give me a whole different nickname, wouldn't it? But these nicknames come about as a perceived mistake or, or a perceived character flaw. But nicknames don't give us the whole picture of the person. I brush my teeth now. Can I share that with everybody? The pastor brushes his teeth. Um, so Thomas, I'm going to try to keep from referring to him as Doubting Thomas, just the Apostle Thomas. Let's do that. The Apostle Thomas. Another side of him you might not know. Now, Thomas, after this encounter that we read about in, in John, um, while all the rest of the disciples stayed in and around Jerusalem, in and around Israel and that area, Tom, Tom, make him personal, Tom went east. Tom went further away than the rest did. The, now, Peter and Paul, we know, went as far as Rome and maybe even Spain. But Thomas went to India. Did you know that? Thomas went to India and, and, and went as far as he could to India and, and almost, in fact, he was, he was referred to as the twin, right? Now let's take a look at that for a minute because it's, it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of cool because his name, when we read it, remember uh, Thomas, who's called the twin? We read through the story, maybe you've heard him call that, or, or maybe you've heard the phrase Thomas Didymus. Uh, well, Thomas in Hebrew and Aramaic means twin. So Thomas's name is twin. And Didymus in Greek also means twin. So he's the twin known as the twin. But who is he a twin of? Oh, he's a twin of Jesus. Now, maybe not physically, maybe not biologically, but by his appearance, by his teachings, by his actions, by the, by the things that he did, by the way he lived his life, he looked like he could be Jesus himself. And so he was called the twin. Now, it's possible he could have been a biological brother of Jesus's. You know, we, we know that Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. Um, and this is just kind of a given in the, the book of Mark, which is the, as we talked about last week, the earliest gospel record. And Mark names the brothers rather matter-of-factly in his gospel. He talks about James as one of his brothers, uh, who probably is the James who authored the book in the New Testament, or the letter in the New Testament. Uh, Joseph. Uh, who some translations um, have Joseph in there for a name of a second brother. A third brother named Judas, who's probably Thomas. Because his name was, was Judas Thomas, because they didn't want to confuse this Judas with the other guy. Right? He's got his whole other baggage with him, right? So they keep this guy away from that guy. So this Thomas is, 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 is Judas Thomas. And um, one of the ways we know this is from the, a copy of, of the Gospel of Thomas, um, a, a, a Nag Hammadi copy of the Gospel of Thomas that, that begins, his Gospel begins, these are the secret sayings 
that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus, Judas Thomas, recorded. So we know this Judas Thomas, he referred to himself and he's referred to as Judas Thomas, who is possibly Jesus' brother. And the other fourth brother is Simon. I don't really know anything about him. He may have been, because we don't know much about him, he might have been one of the brothers who, who bought into the, the idea that Jesus was crazy. Remember in Mark chapter 3, Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters go to Jesus because the stories are out there that he's out of his mind because of his teachings and his preachings, because of what he's doing. Maybe he was part of that crowd. And so, we, you know, that's the, that's the guy we don't talk about that much in our family. In my family, that would be me. And Mark mentions the name of his sister, does not mention the name of his sisters, but uh, early Christian tradition says that there were two, Mary and Salome, who were the ones who, who went to the uh, tomb on Easter morning with Mary Magdalene. Now, Thomas, the twin, went to India, as I said, and he took the message of Christ to India. And he founded seven and a half churches. How do you found a half a church? It's a good question. You know, we know he did seven for sure, and there's an eighth one that might be possible. So, you know, seven and a half. And I tell you where they were, but anybody really familiar with India geography? Raise your hand up. So I thought, I don't know where they are either. But there are, are seven, maybe eight churches in South India that are, were founded by him. And these, these people are, are what we are referred to in, in, uh, in history as, as uh, Christians from Syria, the Syrian Christians. But they're also referred to as Thomas Christians in history. Isn't that interesting? Thomas Christians. They had their own, their own brand of, of Christianity. Now, before you think that's odd, we're Wesleyan Christians, right? Our brand of Christianity is, is based on John Wesley. So we're Wesleyan Christians. This was a group of people, a whole group of people in India that were known as Thomas Christians. We also have Lutheran Christians, right? So Martin Luther, Lutherans. So there was this whole sect of, of people in the early church existing in India that we know very little about or are taught very little about, let me put it that way, because his story is, is, is different than the, the others that stayed in Israel and surrounding area and to the west. In fact, some suggest that that Thomas actually even made it to China during his his missionary journeys, and he he was he was sainted because of his work in India, because of these seven churches, maybe eight, and he was sainted before the church even existed. He was kind of grandfathered in as a as a saint, and then the the church came into being as a separate entity from Judaism, and they sainted him officially. So he is a saint, and he was martyred. He was martyred in India. He was kicked out of the city for proclaiming the words of Jesus, and as he was leaving the city, and as he was in hiding, he was, he was approached by men with spears who ran him through and killed him for his work for Christ. And there's some discrepancy between the dates of this, either July 3rd and 72, or maybe December 21st and 52. And it's kind of interesting because it depends on whether you're part of which, with which church you're a part of, as far as the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, uh, um, Catholic, 
various uh, Protestant branches will have one or other of those dates as St. Thomas Day, like we have a uh, St. Francis Day or other saints that we lift up. And he was entombed in, in, in India. That's where he, he was buried and his remains are. And there's two shrines that were built for him, one in India, where he ministered, where he was known, where he was martyred, and one in Italy, the home of the Catholic Church. So although Thomas needed to see to believe, he did believe, didn't he? And why we remember him for the doubting and not for the work that he did for Christ is beyond me. Because all we remember is doubting Thomas. And so no matter what others think of you, what nicknames you've had, or just names you've been called, No matter what others think of you or remember about you, remain faithful to God's calling. Remain faithful to the mission that Jesus has called you to, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's why we're here. That's why each and every one of us, as a follower of Jesus, is here. Sometimes we get in our heads, don't we? And we hear these labels and these nicknames and these names we've been told we are. And it keeps us from moving forward because we identify ourselves with those negative traits, those last mistakes. But you know, in the end, it's not about you anyway. It's not about me. It's about Jesus and his life and his teaching and his way of living and his way of self-sacrifice, his way to a new life that is open to us all if we just believe. It's about living the resurrection. Amen.
trust in you. Standing. That sounded like a spirit moving song to me. Oh, go this day and every day knowing that you can have the life that God wants you to have by having faith, believing in Him, and living according to the life and ways, teachings of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in love. Amen. Thank you.